And we are live. Hello, everybody who is already saying hello in the chat box and wishing us the best of luck for this drama free, technical issue free webinar. Thank you, everybody who did join us last time that we did our take one. And we are back. There is now no storm in Melbourne. Thank you so much for asking. Ross got a hooray from Leanne, so that's a really good sign so far. Being no storm, that means I actually can't use that as an excuse if it doesn't work this time. So really fingers crossed all round. We seem to be coming through well so far. Everyone who is here, please do join in on the chat box below to say hello, ask questions, please share your own story, comments on the topic that we're talking about tonight. As always, let's start with a really fun disclaimer. This is informational purpose driven only. This cannot replace, of course, any medical advice that you have been given by a practitioner. And if you feel you are experiencing Peronis or you'd like more information, I've included Joe's email. Do get in touch with her for an appointment or, of course, see your GP or urologist. Now, the chat box below is for questions. It's for comments. I will ask you, of course, the second disclaimer. Everyone's journey is different. So share your story. But please, let's keep this advice free. Leading questions, I'm all for, but advice free. So crack straight into it. Hello, Joe. Thank you for joining us again. Hi, and thanks for having me again. <laughs> You're coming through loud and clear. It's just beautiful. So Joe Milios, as I'm sure anyone who's watched our two little promo videos so far knows, Joe is a men's health expert, a researcher in the space of prostate cancer treatment and sexual dysfunction afterwards in particular. And Joe's a physiotherapist based over in WA. So Joe, I'd love to actually just first get into asking you, well, what is Peroni's disease, the topic we're here to discuss, and how did you really get interested in researching this further for prostate cancer in particular? Yeah, thanks, Victoria. Well, um, Peroni's disease is basically known as a curvature of the penis. So men will often feel um, some discomfort or pain initially that over time might develop into a small lump um, that can cause either a bend or a hinging action that over time the lumps can get bigger and harder to become calcified um, and you can actually end up with quite a severe curve. So Peroni's disease is something that affects about one in 10 men in um, everyday um, population. And um, it's, it's, you know, it's something that has quite debilitating consequences on male self-esteem and, and sexual function and relationships. And um, how I came about um, working in this field was really quite by accident. And um, in my little promo earlier, um, it basically stemmed about from one particular patient knocking on my door in quite a distressed state one day. And he'd had a radical prostatectomy one year earlier and produced a, a photograph of his penis, which he was embarrassed to take, but wanted, you know, someone to identify what was going on. He was quite certain that his prostate cancer had returned because he felt this hard lump and there was some pain. So um, basically I reassured him that it was probably something called Peroni's disease and that I would look into it. And um, yeah, that's, that's how my journey began. Great. Thank you, Joe. So I'm sure one of the first things you, of course, looked at were the treatment options that are available. And last time we did the webinar, people were specifically saying they've only heard that there's surgery. Is there anything other than surgery? So could you talk us through that? No, it's actually um, a condition that has stumped a lot of um, medical um, people for, for a couple of centuries, really. Um, so we do actually know that it's probably going to get worse in most cases. So so there's been research to show that 12% of men who have Peroni's disease will naturally recover. Men will worsen over time and that 40% of men will basically stay the same. So in 88% of the cases, once it's there, it's there to stay or get worse. So unfortunately, a lot of treatments that have been trialled have not actually had the outcomes in the real world that were supposedly going to happen from research and trials and things like that. So there's a whole range of things. Just running through them, um, most people probably know about injections, something called Xyloflex, which is um, to inject the actual plaque. Um, there's uh, vacuum pumps that are known to help. There's also um, things called traction devices, and uh, they are sort of cumbersome type um, uh, pieces of equipment that needed to be worn on the on the penis over a, sort of a six to eight hour time frame per day. Uh, then there's medications, so there's oral medications. Um, the PDE fives like Cialis are commonly um, recommended, and there's some other ones that have been in and out of trials. 
that unfortunately have never shown more than about a placebo effect of about 40 percent and then of course there's surgery and there's three different types of surgery um, that all probably are the the last point of um, request from most men most men don't want to really approach the surgical side of things because that has complications but um, there's some good options for that as well and we can talk about more, more of that in detail. So what, what really was my concern was that in the early phases of Peyronie's disease development, what we call the acute phase, which usually lasts up to 12 months, there's really nothing recommended that will help. Um, and most of my patients who were told there's nothing we can do, you can try the injections but they are costing like $1,200 each they're only effective about 30% of the time. Uh, it just like left with suck it up and see and come back in 12 months and we'll see how you're going. And most men are very distressed to not be able to help themselves a little bit. So I just felt that maybe some, some options might be available in that window that perhaps a physiotherapist could be involved with. Yeah, that's great. It's great how you've approached it and knowing as well how distressing it can be to just be told, look, go and wait and see. And it sounds like, so after prostate cancer treatment, and this is probably related to a question we've just had in the chat box. Now, are men more susceptible to Peyronie's disease and that acute window you talked about, especially due to that lack of blood flow from lack of nerve sort of stimulation um, over that period of time? So someone in the chat box has actually put it as, look, is this a case if you sort of use it or lose it? Is this sort of a part of that whole concept? Yeah, absolutely. So we know that once, for example, you have a radical prostatectomy, there's a window of at least three or four months where the nerve is basically in a state of shock or neuropraxia. So what that means is the nocturnal erections that are supposed to happen physiologically every night, roughly six times, stop happening. So if you add that up over a whole year, men are missing out on about 2,000 physiological erections per year. That's regardless of any sexual activity. So without that general blood flow going through, unfortunately, that window of the first three to four months and beyond up to two years when we say um, the nerves are in recovery for, is a whole window of time where potentially the tissue is becoming fibrous, turning into scar tissue plaques and, and potentially calcification. So we do need to, yeah, have this conversation to let men know, look out for these types of um, side effects, which hopefully will be preventable with early penile rehabilitation and pelvic floor exercises and medications and things that your urologists are hopefully prescribing for you to, to minimise the impact of um, that reduced blood flow. Yes. Now, could you actually relate to me, what is the prevalence of the case of Peyronie's disease after prostate cancer, and actually in comparison to, say, somebody who hasn't had prostate cancer treatment? So um, it was always thought that there was only about 1%, maybe 3% at the most of the average population that was diagnosed with um, Peyronie's disease. Then there was some research done by a really famous um, New York urologist called John Mulhall, and he was, was screening men for prostate cancer to see if there were certain things that might predispose men being diagnosed with prostate cancer. And he found that about 9% of men actually had um, Peyronie's disease and plaque formations occurring. So that meant it was more like a one in 10 or 11 men without prostate cancer. So those that are treated for prostate cancer, we've actually had research done um, to show that one in um, six men after a radical prostatectomy and one in eight men after um, the external beam radiation therapy may unfortunately be left with um, some Peyronie's or penile deformities. But my hunch is that if we educate our patients about the need to not only improve the local blood flow, but do things to help their general lifestyle, like reducing um, the burden on their heart, for example, heart health and hard health are very intertwined, but just getting that general fitness message out there as well. But to let men know that if they're concerned, if they find any discomfort or any small part, that it's not something to ignore, that the sooner we can get an opportunity to get some help with it, the less likely it might move into calcification requiring surgery. Yeah, that's a great message. And also you got to say hard health and heart health are very interlinked. I'm personally going to probably make T-shirts and mugs that say that, so very <laughs> good. Yes, yeah, so we've got a question come through. Somebody's asking, well, Ross is asking, thanks, Ross. Look, does the use of penile injections 
cause Peyronie's disease. And remember, this was mentioned last time as well. Look, and it's it's also in my mind. I've had a few clients who've wondered after they've used the intracavernosal injections, has that led to any kind of deformities? But what have you found? Yeah, and I actually um, contacted a, another patient quite soon after I worked with my first patient who had sort of alluded to this occurring after he'd had a number of penile injections and he was quite certain that that was the beginning of his problems. Um, I've done quite extensive reading and from what I can tell, even from um, the product statements like the Cavajet, they actually say if there is any plaque formation before you start this um, injection therapy or if anything develops, stop immediately. There, there has been um, several papers that have been able to have a link and I believe, and I'm not 100% sure here, but I believe that they've modified um, quite a, a lot of the dosage percentages and things to try and minimise pain and bruising. And so I, I see a few cases myself and I do think anything that might cause injury to the area in genetically susceptible individuals may turn for the worse in the context of Crohn's disease development. So there are people who are more prone to it um, one thing that genetically might people might not know about, but there's something called Tupitrin's contracture, which is a contracture of the hand, and particularly the fourth and fifth digits, which starts to curl down. And 40% of men who have this have Peyronie's disease. So there can be some things to look out for, even in your family history, as to knowing whether or not you might be more susceptible. How so interesting. That's really interesting. Uh, actually, in talking about look, things to look out for, you've mentioned that you focused your research really on that 12 month window you call the acute phase. So yeah. what would somebody who's potentially in that window of time be looking for? What would they maybe notice that they should keep an eye on and be aware of? Well, I had a classic patient this morning and he said um, pretty much he had um, no concerns whatsoever, though he, he felt that genetically he had a slight curve in his penis penis of about 10 degrees to the left. About two months ago, he started to notice just a slight amount of discomfort when he was having sex with his wife. And he said it had never bothered him before. He was 48 years of age. Um, he wasn't overly concerned about it, but about a week later, he was just having a shower and noticed a, a lump, a small, like seaside lump inside his penis when he was just washing himself. And over the next six weeks, it's basically grown bigger to like a pea size. So he's gone off to have an ultrasound scan and found that he actually does have um, calcification, um, which may not respond to the treatment that I can do. Um, what's a mystery to me is now having worked with probably close to 100 men, there's no real textbook case. Um, there's supposed to be an acute phase of 12 months and then after that potentially a chronic phase where it won't change. But I've even had a patient who's had been in the acute phase for 13 years with pain, that's settled quite nicely with the ultrasound therapy I've tried. So I sort of now take each case on their individual merits and try and personalise my treatments. But yeah, early on, it's just looking for any slight pain, physical change and deformity that just, you know, or indentation. Um, sometimes there's just like a, uh, and yeah, a, like a ripple that occurs or a indenting that just, has suddenly appeared from nowhere there's going to be something going on with your erectile function that's not quite right and it's really important to not ignore that great thank you joe and you mentioned your ultrasound treatment so i'd love to move to that i want to of course acknowledge we're getting some great stories from the chat box and also lovely question from alan that's just come through in the stories relating to injections so i'd like to thank heather of course earlier who of course pointed out that it's the wives and partners as well who go through distress when something like this is occurring, that's always really good for us to acknowledge and remember as we talk. And Martin's also written that he's had two trimax reverse reactions. And that's what you meant before, Joe, that say injury occurred after the use of injection, that that potentially could lead to deformity. And he's now experiencing two plaques. Um, and he mentioned his specialists, I think they're not recorded by my specialists as far as I know. So he might be saying that his specialists haven't um, potentially known why, why that was. Right, yeah. So, yeah, and Heather's also mentioned that um, now they're getting some erectile function back, it's showing Peronis. I'm wondering, is that the case? That is, is it as erectile function comes back that often it becomes obvious that something... Oh, well, that's a really good question. So I can show you this, this um, model here again, this diagram. So this was um, the patient when he came in to see me day one. 
So there's quite a curvature there. And he had reported that he started to notice that curvature starting from about eight months after his surgery. And this was four months later. So there was gradually, as his blood flow increased, as his nerve recovery increased and his sensation increased, he was able to get better um, erectile function in tumescence. However, the curve became more obvious. There's also quite a strong thought that pot potentially men with erectile dysfunction have this problem, but they don't realise until a year or two later when the tissues start to expand and the, the compromise is more evident. So, yeah, it, it can definitely um, change over time. And it's just really important to just know what feels right for you and what what subtle little changes might be occurring. Because with everything, it's a case of, you know, early prevention is better than cure. Yes, that's well said. Yeah, across the board, the more you can catch something early on and knowing, of course, that there is something to catch early on, as you said it best, it's knowing your own body and then being able to tell when there is a change. Mm. And yes, Martin's also repeated that, that yeah, he's found that it's when you start to recover that you find this new discovery, um, not the discovery that you kind of wanted to find Columbus-wise. Yeah. And look, love to, um, oh, sorry, real quick, Joe, what was that? I was just going to say, and just on that, um, it, I found it really difficult to find information about Peroni's disease after um, radiation therapy. And one paper describes it, and it was only written in 2017. And it's a really helpful paper. But basically it said it, it may take um, up to three years for erectile function to changes in a man who's had um, this uh, external beam therapy or even some brachytherapy. So over that time, there might be a really slow degrading of function and potentially years beyond that. And we know that can certainly happen with um, scar tissue development in terms of the urethral strictures, strictures and continence. So Unfortunately, um, as one one um, urologist said at, at the prostate cancer meeting last year, radiation can, can sometimes be the gift that keeps on giving. So it's, once again, just knowing what is normal for you and, you know, addressing any issues that pop up. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. <laughs> uh, um, Alan's asked a question, and this is relating back to the idea of sort of, look, a, pre a prevention may be the, you know, the best possible practice when it comes to delivering an kind of notional, sorry, an yep. injection in order to make an erection. He's asking, yep. look, would inject, in your opinion, do you think injecting both sides or at different sides, would that help to avoid it? Absolutely. Injection? So what we, what we want to try and do is make sure that you get a really thorough uh, education on uh, from your, you know, practitioner, medical practitioner initially. And there needs to be quite a, you know, strict protocol to follow through. And you want to definitely change from one side to the other. And um, I, I believe it's it's encouraged to have at least a 48-hour 48, a 48 window between one injection and another. And to go up and down the shaft of the penis, it doesn't necessarily always have to be in exactly the same area. And, um, yeah, just following the protocol of gently massaging the area afterwards and um, yeah, just you're reporting pain if the erection goes on too long or there's any significant bruising because, you know, potentially in some, some guys, a small bruise might lead to some um, fibrosis and plaque development. So it's, it's something to be careful with, but not horrified by it. It's only, it's only a tiny needle. So it's not going to, you know, cause most of the time too much of a, a soft tissue injury. It's just that some people are a little bit more susceptible to the, the trauma developing more. Great, thank you, Joe. That's really good. I think it's always good to, especially when it comes to injections, having the reiteration on what best practice is. And the number one best practice, of course, is to have this done by a trained professional, follow a good protocol. So speaking protocols, I actually had a text message that came through today from somebody who is a patient of yours and has been seeing you since January for the treatment protocol that you described and that you discovered through your research for ultrasound therapy. So I'd love to actually read out his journey. Um, he sent this okay. through, it's lovely, and he also mentioned, look, how wonderfully supportive and great you've been through this process, and he sounds quite delighted with his results. So um, this is Doug's story, and he wrote in to say that he underwent prostate, uh, prostate cancer treatment robotic prostatectomy two years ago. He then noticed the curvature of his penis in November just last year, and he then actually came out, came to find out about what Peroni's was through the advertising for this exact webinar, um, the first version, of course, and he's 
gone to see her and tried out the ultrasound treatment protocol, uh, which commenced in January. And he mentioned that the curvature looked around 40 to 45 degrees at that point with a small hardness that was around a five cent piece and was very firm. He's mentioned he's had nine sessions of ultrasound with you and that that curvature has now reduced to 30 degrees and the hardness has now softened. So I am fascinated, Joe. Please talk us through what is this treatment protocol that Doug has just gone through with you? Okay, well, um, it's really nice to hear Doug's, uh, Doug's contribution there because he's a, a current patient and he's experiencing it firsthand. And, um, you know, it was great that he found out about that, me being in Perth through your promotion of this webinar. Um, so, yeah, the the honest truth is that I, I really was a bit stumped by this particular condition and I happened to be going over to Chicago for a family holiday. It's about five years ago now. And I met up with a um, physiotherapist for dinner, a lady called Sandy Hilton. And I said, look, I've got this, you know, case at the moment and it's really bothering me. The guy's really distressed. And when I go home, I'm, I'm going to try and work on it. And basically she said, what is it? And I talked about this curvature of the penis brain. She goes, well, Joe, I used to work in the military and I had three or four patients like 20 years ago who had like injuries and we provided ultrasounds every day normal physiotherapy, therapeutic ultrasound, and it seemed to help them. And she said, we, we roughly did 10 to 12 sessions over a month and, you know, those guys didn't come back. So I looked into it and I was so pleased to see that in actual fact there had been some fairly extensive case study reports done way back from the 1950s. So um, several other uh, urologists, I believe, had actually started using the treatments. So really it was nothing new. It was just me trying to work out what parameters might work best with the technology that we now have today. So the last trial was done in 1983 and it showed that out of 25 men with perennial disease, 19 were assisted by the ultrasound therapy. So it's just, um, I've got a picture of it here. I don't know if you can see that very well. Um, just applying ultrasound. And it's probably not the best picture there, but it's just um, basically the ultrasound um, identified from where the patient actually describes his pain is so I, I basically get him to disrobe. He shows me where his area of um, plaque or concern is. I match that up with a, a proper penile Doppler scan that has been done and measured that um, whole area. And then we basically apply the ultrasound directly. So it's a, it's a case of just providing some deep heat therapy that um, is tolerable to the, to the man. So it's meant to be a, a mild, comfortable warmth over a period of about 10 minutes. And I provide that um, over about a four-week period, aiming to do three sessions per week. So what I did was 12 sessions in total, and then I got my patients in the research to then go away and have a repeat of their Doppler scan. And we were able to show quite significant changes, which they called biological data, measurable. So the areas of plaque were beginning to diminish in several patients had completely resolved, but in most patients were recovering. And the difficulty is I didn't really know how many ultrasound sessions to provide. And I picked 12. Um, that was a little reflection of where Sandy Hilton was at. But then I found out others had been doing more like 20 to 25 sessions with, with these sort of similar outcomes to me. Uh, so I'm pleased to say that I'm now sort of work, working more individually with patients. If they are not improving by the 12 sessions, I always encourage them to um, have the scan and quite often they're showing quite marked improvement but they haven't actually had the correction in the deformity at that point in time so um, a vacuum pump is the next step to aid that so the ultrasound is basically softening up the tissue which by the way enables men to often become more handy and malleable with their penis so they they were often able to resume sexual activity which many of the partners reported as being much more comfortable that was a real bonus to me that men could you know regain that intimacy um, that they were missing out on from quite early on in um, several cases so yeah overall the ultrasound is just there to try and work on this acute phase before there's any calcification to try and um, remodel the tissues and with um, a little bit of self-massage as well um, and potentially the vacuum pump we've been able to show quite significant improvements in not only the plaques but also the degree of curvature decreasing and um, yeah certainly all the patients that I work with have had a complete resolution of their pain and that's also a comforting thing so yeah there's been some really optimistic outcomes 
Uh, I've got a paper in submission at the moment, so I can't share all my results, but um, it, it's, it's an option and it really comes down to education. So if men know earlier on, before it's at a point where it's become too calcified for the ultrasound to penetrate or benefit, then we're going to be a lot better off and we're going to have a, a lot less of these more severe Pyronis cases um, to see. Jo, that is marvellous. The research you're doing is fantastic. And I can imagine it's just so wonderful that you're getting that positive feedback from men and their partners that you're making their lives so great. So very, very pleased to hear all of that. And it's led to some amazing um, questions and comments from the chat box as well. So I'd love to start with Heather. Thank you so much for sharing this, that uh, Heather's seen urologist who told her and her partner that if the curvature is over 30 degrees, that they were actually at the end of the road and the implant was the only option. I wonder if you could comment on that, Joe's. So you mentioned the plaque developing too far. What sort of is that point? Yeah, well, if you, if you have a look at, I'm um, sorry, this one. So this this patient here, this was the before, and that's more that's like a 75 to 80 degree curve. And then this is um, what was after the 12 ultrasound sessions. It's down to about a... 20 degree curve we, once we actually then applied the um ultra sorry the vacuum pump that pretty much corrected back to being normal so um if it's like calcified and it's a rigid really hard lump that we can feel then there's a lot of um treatments that won't help but and surgery might be the only one but we talk about 60 degrees more likely to be requiring surgery. But this started off way beyond that and went down to this. And this was um, a sort of, you know, this was one of my cases, but he had complete resolution on that plaque um, scan uh, from beginning to, to end. So I really have to say the ultrasonographer was really um, supportive because he was blinded to what what treatment I was providing because it was a random control trial. And um, he, to this day, continues to let guys know that, you know, there is some treatment that is helping. And he always says to them, I, if I hadn't seen it for myself, I wouldn't believe that this treatment could be helpful. And that's encouraging for me because um, I don't have that sophistication um, of technology to measure and assess um, the actual plaques. But he he's seen the before and after and... Um, yeah, his, his feedback has really been encouraging. Thank you, Joe. Now, I'm conscious we've only got a couple more minutes left. Barry's asked a couple of interesting questions, but I'd love to know, actually, look, if the plaque's on one side or the other, does that change where the bend is? Um, and he's also wondering, which I am too, look, are most physios at, the, at this point in time able to undertake the rehabilitation protocol that you have come up with? Or yeah. well, what would somebody find somebody who could do this? Yeah, well, um, first of all, the, 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 where the position of the plaque is, so say it's on the right side, then, the, then the, the curve tends to be towards the right side. So it tends to kink on that side. So that becomes the shortened side. So it's on the, if it's on the left side, they'll turn around, they'll curve to the left side, should I say. Um, the fact is that um, because it's a new treatment in terms of having not had it published yet, I presented it at a couple of conferences internationally and here in Australia, but they were based on my early case studies. It's really difficult to... Um, have people recommend your treatment until it's like proven and it's in you know written evidence but I have actually taught quite a number of physiotherapists um, internationally and in Australia um, how to do this any physiotherapist could do it um, because we've all been trained in ultrasound therapy mm -hmm. and um, I've I've got many therapists around the world who actually just ask my protocol and I'm always happy to share it it's just the intensity and the the, the amount of heat um, that varies with each individual Great. Thank you, Joe. Well, look, we're nearing the very end. I want to also just thank Heather and Martin have been sharing a lot of their journey in the chat box. And look, Heather's actually finished with quite an interesting point that look, they've been using a vacuum pump since they've had surgery. And she shared earlier that they are now, of course, noticing plaques. And look, this is something that I'm very interested in learning more about too. You know, if somebody is still doing a specific sort of rehab um, protocol to keep blood flow going, it sounds like look, you can still experience quite literally bumps in the road. Joe. I'm wondering, um, what would you what would you like every man to know who's gone through the prostate cancer treatment journey? What what sort of um what sort of exercise or anything that they could even implement this week going forward they could do at home to sort of get the best journey they can have? Yes, yeah, so great question from everyone involved there. I honestly think that every man has a right to know that potentially 
his erectile function after his treatment for prostate cancer will be affected, and that's not always discussed. Um, that he should be offered the opportunity to work with a um, penile rehabilitation specialist, so a sexual medicine physician if the urologist is not um, really keen to manage it, to start on um, the whole regime of uh, medications and vacuum pumps to try and minimise the deoxygenation and, and the damage that actually occurs in the short term from, from not having the physiological erections going on. Secondly, that pelvic floor exercises are like a mainstream part of my PhD. They actually help not, e not only women, but men in their continent sexual and bowel function. So that if every man knew how to exercise his pelvic floor um, prior to any treatment for, for prostate cancer, including radiation therapies, which can also affect the bowel, that, that that would be a really important thing. And last but not least, just improving that um, cardiovascular fitness generally and blood flow anywhere is good blood for blood flow everywhere and it's okay to you know self-stimulate it's okay to engage in sexual activity and just be aware of what feels normal and if it doesn't go and seek some medical advice sooner rather than later joe thank you so much thank you for sharing all of your wonderful research, your conversation with us tonight. And I'd love to know finally, if people want to get in touch with you to find out more or to actually see you for an appointment, what's the best way they can do that? Um, well, I'm, I'm obviously I'm located in Perth, but I do actually um, do a few Skype consultations with um, patients from time to time. I'm looking after a couple in Canada at the moment. So um, just my website, which is um, Men's Health Physiotherapy, .com.au there's a um, something you can send there or um, if you want to email me directly it's um, complete physiotherapy at gmail.com and I'm on there all the time um, I also run a Facebook group uh, for men men's health physiotherapists internationally um, so if there's any physios who want to know a little bit more that's easy to to jump on but also a phone call away <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Joe. And all those details as well will be sent follow up email tomorrow. And there'll also be a replay of the video then too. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight and for your wonderful questions and comments in the chat box. And thank you again for giving us a second chance too, to give you this one uh, wonderful webinar. And once again, thank you, Joe. Thank you so much. And um, good luck with anyone who's dealing with it and keep asking for help. Fantastic. Thank you. Bye.